You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era and fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine and actress-writer Nan McNamara. So Steve, did Ava Gardner and Howard Hughes have a good relationship? Well, they did until he dislocated her jaw. What? Well, don't worry. She hit him back with an ashtray. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign is the gin joint for you. Little fellow, you must have given up the hope of living. Uh Uh-uh. On the contrary, I do not let the word death bother me. Same here, baby. Then what are you waiting for? (laughs) Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. The cream of the crop! Hello and welcome to Triviality, and we're all back in the studio back. except for Matt, who will Every never last be back. One of us. Hi, Matt. How you doing in LA? Yep, pandemic and earthquakes. Otherwise, things are awesome over here. We're all masked up over here. Yeah, we're all we got we got an extra pop filter, so to speak. There yeah. might be a bit more rustling than usual, but yeah, we have a little uh, little mask uh, addition here, and then also we put up some sound dampening uh, squares. Buy some squares. It looks very professional in the studio. It does. Thank you. We we made them ourselves, and uh, <laughs> hopefully they will do the trick and provide some better audio for and you. Hopefully, fine folks. I hung them well enough; they won't fall off the walls. That would be good. Can you brought blank? Put them up. You guys are in trouble. I did bring a blanket to uh, to hang over the uh, windows. It's got uh, colorful hedgehogs on it. It is kind of adorable. Blanky, uh, <laughs> what do you think about this new setup? Is, okay. bl- is Blanky a new character? <laughs> No, well, Blanky just told me something, and I, I definitely disagree that that's the best Russell Crowe character, but, you know, whatever, it's to each his own. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, but we have some special guests here today. Uh, as you heard in the intro, today's a game of death. So uh, it's going to be one competitor entering, one leaving at the end of the show, no deaths, but lots of trivia. Uh, to introduce our contestant today, uh, it's someone that told us that his daughter Maggie almost stole his Universal Champion box. Is that right, Josh Head? That is correct. Uh, I got it in the mail uh, a few days before her fourth birthday, and so she uh, she was like, "This is mine, right?" And I was like, mm, "No, it's Daddy's." And, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you know, back on the show again. I think this is my third time. Um, we have been sitting at home just like most everybody else, and. Uh, that's given me a lot of time to prepare for the game of death. So uh, been, you know, working out and fighting mentally and ready to go. Good. Nice. Josh Head with a Vengeance. Is yeah, well, welcome back to the show. And it was uh, really a uh, pleasure talking to you so much at uh, Geek Bowl, too. So. Yeah, for sure. I, I had a great time at the at the event you guys threw, and or with everybody else too. But uh, yeah, it was really fun, and yeah. I hope that all this is over, and you guys can come down to Austin next year. Mm-hmm. Let's let's hope so. We yeah, hope. those Universal Champion boxes are pretty awesome, but for a four year old, I can't imagine that's the best birthday present. So nah, she she doesn't care. She just wants whatever. <laughs> You know, she likes to open things and to say that they're hers. So that's all that matters. <laughs> Don't we all? We just all like opening yeah. things. Um, and that's just going to be an opening to introduce our next guest, the host of today's Game of Death, another Universal Champion, and someone who shares an affinity for a certain music group with me uh, and told a pretty great story about meeting them in person. Uh, and that is Eric Walling. How's it going, Eric? Hey, guys. Good. How are you? Good. It feels like it's been uh, a long time, but it's been about five months since we last talked or four or five months and it's insane how different everything has been mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah in quarantine time that's like nine years so yeah. it's, been, it's been a while yeah i've aged a dog year <laughs> in that time but yeah yeah neil i noticed uh neil and i had a nice conversation the other day about um one of our favorite bands it's a tribe called quest uh, i got to see them when i was 22, 23, um, and they were on a really small tour in and around uh, the Midwest and played in St. Louis. And my cousin took me. I went. Um, it was a standing room only show. We were the first people in. I walked straight to the front of the stage and didn't move from that spot for the whole <laughs> thing. That's what you got to do. We got to post up. Yeah. My cousin kept trying to get me to come back to the bar. And I said, nope, nope, I'm not moving. This may be my only chance to see him. And it was. And I got to meet 
Fife and uh, and Jerobi and and I almost got to see Q Tip, but somebody ran. It was like a like a a fly, like somebody got too close to him and he just like skittered off. So <laughs> didn't get to see him, but it was a pretty awesome show. So that one I'll always remember. That's a great memory. Uh, well, yeah, they're great. Uh, if you haven't heard them, uh, definitely check them out. But I'm sure everyone knows at least who they are. Um, are we ready in the studio? We're, for, we're ready to so. do Game of Death. So All right, Matt, uh, any rules? Or I think everyone knows what it is. So I can, I can do this, Matt. Yeah, there you go. He'll be facing off uh, with uh, the three of us uh, and then pick one of us to face in the fourth round, which is a topic of his choosing. Uh, also, he'll select two players for the swing round and two players for the final round. Um, he will get double points for the swing round as it's two on one. And those are the rules. Yeah. Well, Otherwise, it operates the same way. Yeah. Well, let's get oiled up. Uh, I guess, Eric, take it away uh, with Josh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going to let uh, Josh decide which uh, which host do you want to start with? Um, you know, let's start with Matt. All right. Good. Because he was on the top of my stack of paper. And that <laughs> Convenient. All right. Well, you won't be surprised to find out that this is a sports uh, category or set of questions. So um, we're going to start off with a with a question called uh, role models. Only three players in the history of Major League Baseball have averaged 45 or more home runs in any 10 year span. Name two of those three. And for clarification, that's that's just a rolling 10 years. It doesn't have to be like a decade, like 1980 to 1990 or, or something like that. Gotcha. OK, um, I'm going to guess. uh Sosa for one and uh, McGuire for the other. Okay. Um, I'm also guessing Sammy. I know he has three of the 60 home run seasons, so that would really weigh that average up. Um, and then for the other was someone who I think was just really consistent in that 45 to 55 range, and I'm going with A-Rod. So points for one person here. Um, the three players that have averaged 45 or more in any 10-year ten, uh, ten span were Sammy Sosa, uh, Babe Ruth and Alex Rodriguez. All and, right. Yeah, Sosa hit 60 home runs three times, never led the league in any of those years. They did it all naturally, all of them. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, uh, uh, you've uh, been taking some PEDs for, for podcasting. <laughs> How's that going for you? It's good. Um, I get a little bit uh, ragey from time to time, but I feel like it's really imp- improved my performance. So. I, I get mm-hmm. ragey from time to time, but I'm not taking anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question number two, Earth's pastime. Name the four NBA players born outside of the United States and its territories to win an NBA MVP. So you're locked in then, I guess? Yeah. yeah. So let me go through my my thinking and see if I can get to a fourth. So I I know Giannis was last year uh, born in Greece. Uh, Olajuwon, born in Africa. Steve Nash, I believe, born in Canada. Um you said out. Oh, I don't know if Tim Duncan counts because, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say Giannis, Hakeem, Steve Nash, and Tim Duncan. Uh, I had one other than you did, but I only had three. Uh, I had Hakeem, uh, Steve Nash, and Dirk Nowitzki. Yeah, so you got all four between the two of you. Um, <laughs> that is Steve Nash, Dirk Nowitzki, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Giannis were the four. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Tim Tim was born in the Virgin Islands, which technically counts, right? That's how that works. Yeah, it's a U.S. Yeah, U.S. territory, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Yeah. So. Okay. I almost said David Robinson, but I remember that he played on a Navy ship, and I was going to say, wasn't he born on a Navy ship on international waters? But that would have been really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> a very specific case. All right, number three. Paul Hubbard isn't a name you associate much with football, but this deaf quarterback from tiny Gallaudet University in the 1890s is credited with inventing what football staple that remains largely unchanged to this day? Oh, I think I know this. I, I can lock in. Pretty sure he I invented guess. the touchdown end zone dance. <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah. he did the, the Irish jig. Right. And the um, uh, he was doing pelvic thrusting in the end zone, which was very <laughs> controversial then. I'm going to say... Uh, like the goalpost? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, so I think I think the clues there. He was a quarterback and um, he was deaf. So I'm guessing to get the play to everybody, he'd have to bring everybody in the close. Huddle. And I think that it's the huddle. <laughs> it is. It is the huddle. He was uh, 
he invented it because he was tired of the other teams who also knew sign language um, stealing the plays. Did he bang on trash cans? <laughs> <laughs> Probably wouldn't have helped him. It wouldn't have helped. <laughs> All right. This question is called, What Mama Don't Know Won't Hurt Her. Bozzini, Roberto Sport, Garlando, Leonhardt, and Tornado are the five internationally recognized playing surfaces that may host a World Cup of what game? Man, three of those playing surfaces are pasta, too, so. <laughs> I'll lock in, I guess. Yeah, I don't I don't know. So, um, they all sound crazy, so I don't I'm thinking some kind of modern extreme sport. I know it's not slam ball, because I don't think they have a World Cup, because it doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I'm going to say slam ball, because I love slam ball. I'm going to say bocce. <laughs> Yeah, so clue in the uh, in the category, or I mean in the in the name of the question, what Mama don't know won't hurt her is because she didn't want Bobby Boucher playing foosball. Mm. Ah, <laughs> should he use my medulla on blow gun? <laughs> er- Eric, you were well. saying uh, that Luxembourg has a pretty stout foosball team, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, there. Uh, I found that out from ESPN two the other night, or the Ocho, really, technically. <laughs> I was gonna say it moved up to two because there's no sports and it's yeah. all that's left. Yeah, it was pretty intense. There's like an entire, uh, yeah, Luxembourg was a, was a powerhouse, which was something that I was not expecting. Um, and uh, America has won five straight World Cups, I think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, go us. This is the only World Cup of soccer we're winning. <laughs> I, I can imagine we'd be good at foosball. There was a there was a foosball table my freshman year of college, and it pr- pretty much resulted in me getting a, a solid 2.0 GPA. So. Pretty good at foosball, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if that was one of the classes, it would have brought it Adam, up a little bit. Adam's family pinball is what did me in. <laughs> All right. Last question in the category. Uh, who is the only player in NBA history to have his number retired for three different franchises? Um, and I'll give you five bonus points if you can name the non-NBA franchise that also retired his number. Um, I'll I'll lock in. Ooh, quick lock in. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I think I think it's Michael Jordan. I know his numbers retired, definitely for the Bulls, definitely for the Heat for some reason. And I'm wondering, and I, I think there's another, there's a baseball team, but I can't remember, because um, I know that when LeBron went to Miami, he chose number six because they retired 23. But now I'm thinking maybe it's not him. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna say Michael Jordan though. Um, yeah, my. Same thought, uh, Michael Jordan, and the for the bonus point, you said the non NBA. Mm-hmm. Um, I say the Birmingham Barons. Yeah, so um, the only player that I had um, to have uh, his number retired by three different franchises was Wilt Chamberlain. That yeah. was my other guess. And the non NBA franchise that his number is retired for is the Harlem Globetrotters. That makes sense. Yeah, that's right. He played for them very early in his career. Right. Which yep, teams? I, it's um, Warriors, Lakers, and the Sixers. 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 Yeah. Yep. That was my other. That was my other guess. Well, after our first fight, it looks like Matt was able to get a left hook and a body blow on Josh for 20 points for Team Triviality, but Josh uh, was in a defensive stance, so he did not have any points in that first first round. Uh, so, Josh, who would you like to face off against in the second? Um, let's go with you, Neil. All right. Well, challenge accepted. Uh, let me just take off my <laughs> shirt and get in my underwear. We, we keep telling you that is not necessary, and we wish you wouldn't do it, but uh, yeah, at least you left the mask on. All right. Uh, category about movie questions. Here we go with meal number one. The most recent entry into the EGOT status was Alan Menken, thanks to his daytime Emmy win for his work on Rapunzel's Tangled Adventure. But he's still a step away from another elite status, the PGOT. That's an EGOT plus Pulitzer. Name either of the American composers to have garnered this achievement. One who is well known for his work in a composing duo, the other better known for his work with a certain Babs. All right, I think I I think I got one, so I'll, I'll lock in. Let Josh talk. Um, so the first one that I can think of, or the first thing that popped in my head was Rodgers and Hammerstein. So one of those two, uh, and I know Babs has got to refer to Barbara Streisand, but I can't think of who that would be. Um, I'm going to go with Rodgers. 
Wow. Yeah. So uh, I knew one of Rogers and Hammerstein was was one of these. And uh, the way I remember is Miss Info did an episode on Stephen Sondheim and uh, Sondheim's mentor was Hammerstein. So I knew it was the other one. So I also went Richard Rogers. Yes, that's correct. Richard Rogers is one of the two. The other one is Marvin Hamlish. Oh, the, mm, the uh, composer of The Sting. It's a great soundtrack. All right. Um, question number two. What best picture winner, perhaps best remembered for reasons other than how great it was, is the lowest budget best picture winner in the history of the Oscars? Um, I'll lock in. Mm. So initially, I remember there was a, a ton of press around uh, Hurt Locker um, being low budget and kind of taking that crown um, and it, it's more remembered because it was Catherine Bigelow who won her Oscar for that for best directing and first female to win a best directing Oscar. But I'm also, wasn't Crash low budget? Wasn't it like 5 million? Maybe not. I mean, it had a lot of stars in it. Um, and I'm only thinking of Crash because Tandy Newton just did a great interview. I think it was for like Vanity Fair or Vulture, uh, about that movie and how crazy it was. Um, yeah, those are the only two movies that I'm coming up with. So I'm just going to go with, uh, Hurt Locker. Um, I said Chariots of Fire. Uh, no points on this one. Uh, probably better remembered for the fact that it wasn't originally announced as the Best Picture winner, but mm. that was Moonlight. I was going to go that way. I should have. I just, I figured your clue was about that, but I didn't know what the budget was. Yeah, one and a half million. Uh, Marty was second with 3.2 million, and then the third on the list is Rocky at 4.6 million. All of it was from uh, Sylvester Stallone's adult film career. Uh, funding All right. there. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to say to that <laughs> <laughs> all right question number three since its inception the x and nc-17 ratings have been something of a death knell for movies but not for every movie rated that way what is the only x or nc-17 rated movie to win an oscar in any in any category while still being rated x uh to clarify it has since been re-rated and downgraded to r Hmm. I can lock in. Okay, so Josh locked in. Uh, this brings me back to uh, a pencil that I got once in a um, glove compartment of a car, and it had like teeth impressions on it. And I remember the teeth were, uh, <laughs> were really gnawing on that pen. Um, and I believe it belonged Everybody's to John Voigt. <laughs> hey, I'm podcasting here. Um, so uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna lock in with uh, Midnight Cowboy. Yep, that's the same for me. Points all around. It is Midnight Cowboy. All right. Yeah. Uh, Dustin Hoffman, man. How about that? How about the 70s for him? All right. <laughs> how about that Dustin Hoffman guy? Astute observation, Neil. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him, but he's uh, he's not bad. <laughs> I've met people like that, though, at like film parties where it's just the guy and all they, they just bring up like really obvious things. Like, how about that Daniel Day Lewis, right? He's a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> no one talks about it, but yeah. uh, Jimmy Stewart, pretty good. He was a likable guy. <laughs> All right. Question number four. While Johnny Carson used a number of guest hosts during his time at the helm of The Tonight Show, Jay Leno was quite the opposite. Only once in 4,600 episodes during Leno's tenure was there a guest host as part of a job swap publicity stunt at NBC. Name the person whom Jay Leno swapped jobs with on May 13th, 2003. That was the one episode where it was funny. <laughs> Probably. Wow. <laughs> I this is an interesting question because I Jay Leno sometimes would be on, but I was always more of a Letterman person, and uh, I'm trying to think of who would have swapped with him. Um, Not Conan, no. <laughs> yeah, that didn't go well. I can't think of anything that was on NBC in 2003. All right, Josh is locked in. Um, the job swatch swatch. <laughs> it's about watches. Uh, the job. Um, <laughs> thing is is screwing me up because if he did it at NBC would it have been like Lauren Michaels or someone else on a big <laughs> NBC property um, but Lauren, I'm not going Lauren Michaels doesn't have fun we know this uh, <laughs> in the news today um, I don't know I, I, I'm not sure I know Joan Rivers used to guest host for Carson a lot and I thought I, she did it for Leno at one point but I, I'm not sure so I'm just going to lock in with Joan Rivers I'm going to lock in with Conan O'Brien uh, yeah, no points here. Um, so Leno, Leno hosted the Tonight Show. She hosted the Today Show. That's uh, Katie Couric. Mm. Oh, wow. Oh, pass. <laughs> <laughs> Matt with the hot take from 2003. <laughs> not only did she not believe in the internet, but she didn't get Matt's uh, approval. I've been saving that take for 17 years. All right, question five in the category. 
thanks to having his knee drained multiple times during the filming of Roadhouse, Patrick Swayze turned down the lead roles in both Tango and Cash and Predator, opting instead to follow it with what significantly less strenuous movie? Oh, uh, I can log in. Mm, so let's see. I uh, yeah, I I I think I'm gonna say uh, Ghost. Yes, uh, I'm also going to go with Ghost. Uh, he championed Whoopi Goldberg to be in that movie. Uh, ended up, she ended up winning an Oscar. Uh, and uh, yeah, that one, the only strenuous activity he had was, uh, you know, rubbing uh, Demi Moore's hands in some clay. So Intense I'm, pottery. Yeah, pottery. So I'm going to go with Ghost as well. Yeah, I didn't need to use his drained knee for uh, making pottery. It was Ghost. All right, Josh. Well, you got three hits. I guess we both tied here. We both got ten, uh, 30 points in that round. So... Well done. Uh, so the scores going into the swing round are 30 for Josh uh, and a slight lead of 50 for Team Triviality. Uh, Ken, how are you feeling before we get into the swing round? Doesn't matter because I have not uh, performed yet. But uh, oh, you're kind of waiting. I'm, I'm just waiting to take my shirt off and my and my <laughs> well, pants. We don't know. Too, I guess. <laughs> it might be me who has to take their shirt off. Well, I mean, eventually I'm taking my shirt off. I'll, I'll give one you, way or another. I'll give you a uh, a little Treaty of Versailles here. I'll take off my shirt and pants, <laughs> right? But leave I, my underwear on. Let's you, all just get naked you in take the off, studio. You take off your underwear, but keep your clothes on. <laughs> like Donald Duck? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Except for your face masks. Leave there your was face a guy, masks there was a guy at the gym that I used to go to. There's always a guy at the gym that... Porky Pig, yeah. <laughs> he porky pigged it he he would just walk around with the shirt on no underwear just hanging out for all the whole world to see you get, you get completely naked and then the first thing you put on is your watch yep i don't <laughs> understand and then your necklace <laughs> yeah then you gotta yeah. fix your hair i never understood the gym when i went it, it was uh i mean the male body is a beautiful thing but uh <laughs> sure it is i don't know <laughs> <laughs> the the locker room was just full of Captain Morgans, guys who just lift up yeah. their leg for no reason. Foot foot up on the bench. That's the key to when you're naked. The horror. The Anyways, horror. let's get on to the uh, swing round. But first, uh, Josh, who do you want to take on? Keeping in mind that you will have to take on the other two in the final. Um, can I hear what the theme is first or no? How did we do that, Matt? We did. Yeah, we did. All right, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so theme for, for the midpoint this round is uh, Tribons. <sighs> I think definitely pick, uh, don't pick Jeff and Ken. <laughs> or Jeff and Matt. You know, I'm going to go with uh, uh, Jeff and uh, Matt. That was wise. Wise, wise. That happened last time, but we got a perfect 10, so feeling terribly left out though i have not yet to... <laughs> yeah, i know you're gonna be you're gonna be cold you're like the pitcher who's you know in the bench and you you have the coat on but you don't have a coat you're just cold I'm just naked I'm... you're just naked with no underwear i'm saving you up for the second round all right. naked and afraid sounds good Featuring ken all right i'll go through these uh 10 tri so um names words places that these all these clues have in common so question number sorry tri number one the city where Spielberg first screened Jaws to a live audience. The original home of the franchise now known as the Kansas City Chiefs. A city where one can turn left off of Houston onto Elm and see a county administration building known for a much different reason. Number two, a baseball player who prefers you not call him Joey, Big Ben, and a character portrayed in various mediums by the likes of Susan Egan, Keegan Connor Tracy, Paige O'Hara, and Emma Watson. Number three, an opaque mineral aggregate of microgranular quartz, the largest national park in the Canadian Rockies, the fictional Missouri home of the Double Deuce. Number four, Gallium, Dragon Force, and a 1981 adult animated sci-fi fantasy film. I understood that one. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, I got one. <laughs> Number five, Vito. Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones vis-a-vis -vis Nicole Ritchie, a fast casual pizza chain headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. Number six, a ubiquitous computer, a Texans quarterback, Spider-Man's muse, Mary Jane. Mm -hmm. Number seven, Jackie Robinson, Bill Clinton, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, <laughs> and everything. 
Didn't even need that last one. All right. Number eight, Justin Long, a little world circuit champ. Mark Morrison, according to Mark Morrison. Number nine, the Planeteer Ma T's Power, a rock band fronted at various times by either of the Wilson sisters. One of the 28 mansions of the Chinese constellation system. Number 10, Damon Albarn, Coco, the Phoenix Suns mascot. And I take back what I said. I'm glad I was not selected for this. So <laughs> I, I am as well. Yeah. Uh, good luck, gentlemen. And we will be right back uh, with our answers. And the answers are now locked in after some rigorous debate. Um, but uh, Matt, can you please remind our listeners how they can uh, get in touch with us and uh, how they can check us out online? Yeah, the best place to reach us. If you had any questions or concerns or we had some comments on this episode, there's going to be a spoiler thread right on the crop at facebook.com slash triviality podcast. Um, just kind of join us there. We have a lot of conversations, a lot of talking, usually about the show and then sometimes other nonsense. Uh, you can see us on Instagram at Triviality Podcast. I think that's at, at Triviality Pod, posting pictures mostly of Neil with ridiculous backgrounds on Skype. Yeah, that's um, for the that's for the youths who don't go on uh, Facebook anymore. Mm-hmm. That's right. And Matt, uh, what what about the crop drop? That thing you started. The thing that I started, yeah, the first one should have already dropped. Uh, if you have any questions, it's sort of an ask me anything style bonus podcast for all of our Patreon listeners. Just send us an email to trivialitypodcast at gmail dot com. Put crop drop in the subject, and we're going to read those every single month. And I also can't wait for the emails uh, that are upset about our in-studio nudity today. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've already written mine. <laughs> yeah, no that judgment. will not be on Instagram, so don't worry about that if that, if that was a concern. I have a, I have a fig leaf in front of my junk, so. <laughs> I brought a, bl- a big black bar made of cardboard. Oh, there you go. Uh, I have a, uh, a single-serve Keurig in front of mine. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm talking about the, the machine, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah the well, machine. That let's knows. go with that. Well, before we further embarrass ourselves, let's get our answers. All right. Uh, I'll go through the tri again, um, see what you guys came up with. So number one was the city where Spielberg first screened Jaws to a live audience, the original home of the franchise now known as the Kansas City Chiefs. The city where one can turn left off Houston onto Elm and see a county administration building known for a much different reason. Um, I went with Dallas. Yeah, we also said Dallas. You are correct. It is Dallas. All right. Number two, a baseball player who preferred you not call him Joey. Big Ben and a character portrayed in various mediums by the likes of Susan Egan, Keegan Connor Tracy, Paige O'Hara, and Emma Watson. Um, I went with Albert, don't call me Joey Bell. <laughs> hmm. So Bell would be the answer. Well, we weren't sure. Um, I was thinking of a player who we used to go by Joey Gallo. Now he goes by Joe. There might have been Gallows at Big Ben by London Tower. And I don't know how it fits in with third one, but we said Gallo. Oh, Josh got it there. Uh, it was Bells. I was unaware of a character named Gallo that Emma Watson might have played, but you might know more than me. No, I was just making it up and hoping for the best. <laughs> I think it was that role where she pointed to her bicep and said it's all real. <laughs> all right, number three was an opaque mineral aggregate of microgranular quartz, the largest national park in the Canadian Rockies, and the fictional Missouri home of the Double Deuce. I've had to think about it for a while, and I came up with Buffalo. Um, I don't know if this fits. I, I did watch Roadhouse not too long ago based on a Neil recommendation. Also, it just happened to be on TV for some reason. Um, but I've been to the Canadian Rockies with Ken. Two national parks we went to there were Banff and Jasper. And I think Jasper might fit for the minerals. So we guessed Jasper. Jasper is correct. It is Jasper. Home of the third largest waterfall in Canada. That, that's not in a later question, I, but I did... <laughs> Um, number four, Gallium, Dragon Force, and a 1981 adult animated sci-fi fantasy film. Uh, that would be heavy metal. Yep. Despite Jeff arguing that Gallium is not that heavy, we said heavy metal. (laughs) Yep. It is heavy metal. Uh, Number five, Vito, Michael Jackson, and Quincy Jones vis-a-vis Nicole Richie, a fast casual pizza chain headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. 
the, the Godfather. Hmm. We weren't sure on this one, so we said Papa John. It points to Josh here. It, they are all Godfathers. Never heard of Godfather's Pizza. Yep. I don't know if there's one here. There might be. I, I've seen the logo before. We had them in Texas at one time. I don't know if they're still here or not. But Was there a lot of oranges in the pizza? <laughs> Only when you were about to die. Okay. okay. Their famous citrus pizza. <laughs> mm-hmm. Horse head pizza. <laughs> A lot of protein. All right. Number six. A ubiquitous computer. A Texans quarterback. Spider-Man's muse, Mary Jane. Um, I went with Watson. Yeah. Based off of Deshaun and uh, the computer that I think was in Jeopardy once. I don't remember. Uh, he said Watson. It was Watson. That's correct. Number seven, Jackie Robinson, Bill Clinton, and the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Um, 42. Based on the book I still haven't read, we said 42. (laughs) That is correct. Also the ASCII code for the asterisk symbol, but Mm. I figured you guys would have it off of the other two clues anyway. All right, number eight, Justin Long, a little world circuit champ and Mark Morrison, according to Mark Morrison. I, I, this was just a guess. Um, I said Mac for mostly Justin Long being in the Mac versus PC. Mm. Yeah. And then that would make sense with return of the Mac, right? Mm -hmm. Too bad that we said loser. So apologies to the Mac there. Yep. Uh, Mark Morrison, of course, saying Return of the Mac, Justin Long, a Mac, and Little Little Mac Mac from Punch Out, right? Punch Out, yep. (laughs) All Macs. I just got that. (laughs) Like after, yeah. All right. Number nine, the Planeteer Matisse Power, a rock fronted at, excuse me, a rock band fronted at various times by either of the Wilson sisters, one of the 28 mansions of the Chinese Constellation System. I didn't want to feel alone, so I said heart. Captain Planet being one of my weird nostalgic memories that I remember every piece of it. It's definitely heart. And that is definitely correct. The weakest of the different planetier powers. I never understood what heart really was. Uh, it was a, a beam of light that did something. How about all the celebrity? Heart, heart was the jubilee of the... <laughs> 100%. Did you guys realize how many celebrity cameos are on that show? It's insane. All the villains like Meg Ryan, Martin Sheen, Ed Asner, Jeff Goldblum. Tom uh, Cruise is on, isn't he? He might have been. I don't know. But Jeff Goldblum played a character called Vem- uh, Verminous Scum and he was a rat. It was because it was it was based as entirely a charity thing, especially for, at least mm-hmm. for the first season. So they were able to get a ton of celebrities who did it as like PR type that stuff. That makes sense. I... Uh... I, uh, I'm going to kill you, Planeteers. I couldn't think of anything to say. <laughs> I mean, the, the micro impression totally worked, though. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, 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 he's, just, he's just thinking. He's just... Oh, t- so Tom Cruise had originally agreed to play the voice of Captain Planet, and then he backed out after six episodes and they removed his audio. Mm. Very weird. Well, it's because it wasn't to the planet Xenu. That's why. <laughs> uh we can move on. <laughs> All right, number 10. Damon Albarn, Coco, and the Phoenix Suns mascot. Um, I was going to say George Costanza, but I'm going to go with Gorillas. Oh, yeah. David, Damon uh, Albarn is the, uh, the singer of Gorillas, I think. that That's where that comes from. Oh, uh, yeah, we said Gorillas. Yep, Damon Albarn, lead singer of Gorillas, Coco the Gorilla, and the Phoenix Suns mascot, the Gorilla. And Blur, right? Wasn't he? Yeah, and Blur. Yep. Yeah. What a swing round. Josh on the offensive, only missing one question. The entire swing round, and if you remember, it is double points for him. So he's picking up 90 extra points. Uh, Matt and Jeff, a little worse for the wear. Uh, they didn't get their footing correct, but uh, they picked up 35 extra points, bringing uh, their totals to 85 for Team Triviality going into the next round, and 120 for Josh. All right, that brings us into the second half. So who do you want to face off against next? Um, I'm going to go against you, Ken. All right, good. I've been sitting here nude looking like an idiot <laughs> for 20 minutes. I think that means I get Josh in his category, though. So, All right, so Ken um, in potpourri and things that I think Ken is interested in. It's always uh, interesting to find out what people think that is. 
And I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right. Question number one. Did he do Neil's back piece? Norman Keith Collins is a tattoo artist better known by what nickname he is said to have received half of his nickname from his similarities to his family's mule and the other half from his later enlistment i'm locked in i don't know a lot of famous tattoo artists i'm trying to think of basically any tattoo artist with a like a famous tattoo artist with a nickname and none are coming to mind right now this is probably going to be painfully obvious when when i hear it yeah, I just have to tap on this. I have no idea. I The only one that I could think of that would be like, you know, I, when I think having a mule, a family mule would be old. So uh, I said Sailor Jerry. Oh, God. That is correct. He, uh, The sailor, half of his nickname from his enlistment in the Navy and his family mule was Jerry. That is Sailor Jerry. Yeah, better known <laughs> for his, uh, his alcoholic beverages these days. But uh, yeah, I should have gotten that. Question number two for Ken. They should have called it Bad Ideas. Taking place two years after the events of Final Fantasy VII and focusing on a plot to resurrect Sephiroth, what was the name of the 2005 computer animated movie sequel to Final Fantasy VII? Locked in. <laughs> That's a good Did you enjoy this movie? Yeah. Um, yeah. I like it a bit. It's funny because there's, um, there's, like there's two versions of the movie. And one mm-hmm. of them is just like all the action scenes and the plot is like not bar- barely understandable. <laughs> and yeah. then the, the longer version is, is quite good. It's just like a cut scene. Yeah. It's like uh, just straight fan service. I, I don't really know much about these kind of questions, so I will have to tap. Yeah, this is an oddly specific question for me. Um, I do recall watching a DVD one time and I saw the trailer for this come on for the first time and I was like, what? There's a movie? And it's uh, Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Yep, right on the head, Ken. It is Final Fantasy VII Advent Children. Is that like a calendar where you open every day and a yes. different child comes out? Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Question number three. I wonder if they got a scarf for that. Clocking in at a memorable two hours, what beautiful game's score garnered it the first ever Grammy nomination for a video game? It would go on to lose to The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo in the best score soundtrack for visual media that year, but still remains the only Grammy-nominated video game in history. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and lock in here. After Josh just said that video game's not a strong suit for him. <laughs> yeah, not a strong suit. Um, unless it's like football manager 2020 or uh... <laughs> that one probably didn't get nominated no for its soundtrack or the uh the, the fun game water reclamation plant or <laughs> yeah actually football like, manager can't... 2020 would be pretty sweet because you there's nothing to do right now <laughs> just take a nap i beat that game in about 15 minutes <laughs> just hit lay off your employees click uh legend of zelda ocarina of time okay so um Two things led me to the answer here. One, I think this game is short, clocking in at about two hours and mostly atmospheric. And then he said something about a scarf um, in the the category. So I think I know what it is. I think it's Journey. Yes, yes, it is. It is Journey, the only video game with a Grammy nomination. Yeah, Journey is great. If you haven't played it, I would highly, highly recommend it. It's a gorgeous game. Play it any way you want it. <laughs> So that's the way you need it ultimately. Yeah. Lately I've been learning more about video games because Henry has gotten into them. So he's uh you know, he he watches all the YouTube uh gamer people and has to bring me his iPad all the time, show me what he's watching and uh <laughs> and I don't understand any of it. So. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. We've been heavy into Animal Crossing in this household the last few months. Uh, mm-hmm. It's pretty high. Not gonna lie, the uh, turnips are pretty expensive this week, but we'll we'll still probably turn a profit on them. Te- <laughs> teach your children early the evils of uncontrolled capitalism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, number four, derived from the Japanese term for another person's house or family. What is the Japanese slang term for people with controlling interests? Used as an equivalent term for nerd or geek culture. All right, I think I'm locked in here. The things that I'm thinking of, like the one word that gets stuck in my head is uh, Yakuza, but I know that that's not it. 
Um, but that's what I'll lock in with. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, I'm sorry, Josh. Sometimes my category is oddly specific <laughs> and difficult, but uh, um, I think I didn't know the first part about this uh, until he said that it was the nerd or geek culture. And I think what he's talking about is otaku. Mm. That is correct, Ken. I am talking about otaku. Yeah, that makes sense now. <laughs> I spend an inordinate amount of time convincing my Japanese friend I am not an otaku. <laughs> Though I kind of am a little bit. It's a gaming website too, isn't it? Mm. Oh, yeah, Kotaku. Yeah. Kotaku. Okay. Yep. All right. Last question in Ken's round. Although Guar should never be confused with children's music, that didn't stop what now defunct electronics chain from using lead singer Odorous Arungus as their, quote, game warrior in a 1994 ad. Oh, I kind of love how crappy Guar is on purpose. I just realized that this is the first year I'm not going to see Guar in like seven years, and I'm really sad about it. Right, Fest is canceled. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, this ad is a beautiful time capsule, by the way. If you go back and watch it on, it's up on YouTube. It's great. Um, I'll lock in. I don't know if this is it, but all right. So I'm thinking of electronic stores that are defunct. One that I'm thinking of is Radio Shack. But they didn't really sell games. Um, could that be Circuit City, maybe? So I think I'm going with Circuit City. Yeah, that's the only one I could think of. It was cir between Circuit City and Comp USA, and uh, Circuit City seems to make more sense. Yeah, Comp USA probably way too square to use Odorous Arungus. It was <laughs> definitely Circuit City. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'll have to look up that ad later. I haven't. I don't yeah. think I've, I. I maybe have seen it, but uh, at the time, I wasn't aware who Odorous Arungus was. <laughs> Matt, are you a fan of Guar's appearance on the uh, the AV Club where they cover music? I think they did it twice. Do you remember that yeah. at all? Yeah, it's so good. Like Billy Ocean. Yeah. After the round with Ken, it looks like Josh is picking up twenty points, bringing his total to one forty. And Ken picked up 40 points for Team Triviality, bringing our total to 125. Uh, Neil, can I put my pants back on now? Or uh, You've done well. You can put your pants back on. I believe your shirt off. Got pop those pecs. <laughs> what pecs? <laughs> it's a podcast, Ken. People can't see. Oh, right. My enormous pecs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh. Uh, last, last one up, obviously, is Jeff. And I think that we found out a little earlier that we are not going to go with the Jeff category. We're going to go with a Josh category. So what was your category? Um, Premier League soccer. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the air just got baseball. sucked out of this room. Question number one in Premier League soccer. Since its inception, the English Premier League titles have been dominated by a small handful of teams. Only seven have won titles in the Premier League time period, and only two of those have won once. Name either team. One who shocked the world by overcoming long odds to win, the other a Northwest England team whose rosy 1995 season led to their title. I can lock in. I'm trying to remember if, was it, was it Man City that had the long odds a couple of years back? Came out of nowhere. Because Man U has been pretty dominant as far as I know. Um, Chelsea's been up there. Swansea, one of them. So it sounds like you have a base knowledge of Premier League. I, I, I like know some teams. Yeah, hmm. that'll <laughs> help. That, that's hard. Sort of how I felt about baseball though last time. Um, I know I heard about it because they were joking about how much you'd have paid off at the end of the season, and I for some reason I thought it was Man City. I don't know. That's what I'll lock in. Okay. Um, the two that I can think of are the uh, Leicester City. And uh, Blackburn Rovers. Leicester City. That was the city I was thinking of. Yep, that is correct. The Leicester City Dons and the Blackburn Rovers. Uh, Leicester City a few years ago, the 5,000 to 1 odds. Blackburn was 1995. I should have known that. Jeff, you got confused. Man City is the alternate nickname of our uh, sweat lodge here. Yes. <laughs> you, could, you could tell it's Man City because of the Keurig Cup. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a bold roast. <laughs> Josh is over there Dude. choking like I do on current. Do you really want to evoke the image of a coffee bean right now, Neil? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I if there was a pool because it's so hot outside, there definitely would be seeing some coffee beans. That's for sure. <laughs> 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 
It's so, I'm just going to be honest, it's so creepy in here because we're wearing masks and I can't see anyone smile, so it's so strange because we're laughing, but you can't see anyone smile. I'm smiling with my eyes. <laughs> All right, let's get the next question in Premier League, which Jeff is definitely going to know. All right. James Milner has played for five English teams, scoring 55 goals in the process. While that goal total in his nearly 500 games played isn't necessarily perfect, his 55 goals coincide with an interesting EPL record. What is that record? Uh, I think I can lock in. Okay, well, it's up to me to take a guess, I guess. So I'll guess that it's also the same number of goals scored by a player in a season. Um, my guess is that uh, he's never missed a penalty. Now, there was a small clue in there uh, that yeah. the 500 games weren't necessarily perfect, but his teams are. They have never lost when he scored a goal. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Uh, he used to play for City, so I forgot that. <laughs> All right. Question number three. Which team recorded the worst season in English Premier League history, mustering only one win, 11 total points, and a nice goal differential of negative 69 in the process. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah. That's good analysis, Ken. Okay, so now I want to think about teams that might play in the Champions Well, League. Matt, I would say that is not good. <laughs> At our color commentary for the New English Premier League, uh, Ken over here. Uh, Ken, uh, that ball was just stolen from Messi. Uh, how does that make you feel? That was not good. <laughs> I don't even think Messi's that, in the English Premier That is but. not how you want to play soccer. Uh, Neil. He plays in the Spanish League. Yeah. That was the only name I could think of at the top of my head. So. In my opinion, you want to try to get the ball in the net. <laughs> From my perspective, that was bad. I'm going to go with... Uh, oh, Jeff, do you want to say? or uh, It doesn't matter. I'm just going to guess a <laughs> Champions League I'm, or a Tier 1. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say uh, Blackpool. Blackpool sounds good. Um, I'm going to guess that too. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to guess, let's see. I'm trying to think. Uh, I'll say Wimbledon. That's tennis, Jeff. No, there's an AFC <laughs> Wimbledon, Ken. That's they're Jeff. A, they're, a, they're a tier one. That's Jeff's favorite Paul Bettany Kirsten Dunst movie of all time. <laughs> All right, uh, no points here. It was in the year 2007. The team was Derby County. Mm -hmm. There's a great, sh a great shirt that went around that was just like the logo of Derby County. It said, I scored on Derby County in 2007. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I remember that now. But um, yeah. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, f Derby County, guys. <laughs> All right, question number four. The FA Cup is the most prestigious tournament in English football, but it isn't the only major tournament in the English calendar. By what Thai energy drink sponsor name is the League Cup better known, formerly known as the Carling Cup? Yeah, way. that was... <laughs> God, I can't think of it now. He says named after an energy drink? Yeah, a Thai energy drink company. Is it the Bang Cup? <laughs> I just love bang energy drinks. God, what is it called? God, I can't think of it. I'm just going to say monster. I know that's not right, but I, that's, I cannot think of it. So I don't think it's monster, and I don't think it's like Red Bull, and I can't think of a Thai energy drink, um, but I'm just going to say one that I, I used to drink and I was quite fond of because of all the Garana, and it was balls. <laughs> <laughs> That is a real thing. Yeah, the, the balls cup is what Neil has in front of his. <laughs> right now. Um, it is the Carabe the Carabao. Carabao. Never heard of the Carabao cup. Yeah. One thing we know about God. Jeff is he's never short of guarana. Car Carabao is made of liquefied <laughs> caribou. Important. God, it just really the takes circle. me off. I, could have, I, I sat here. All I could think of was Carling Cup because that's what I've known it as for so long. But... Uh, all right, final question in the Premier League round. Uh, we're going to do a little little gambling because England loves to gamble on soccer. Name the leading scorer in the first EPL season or the most recent EPL season. And I was going to say five bonus points if you name both, zero points if you get either one wrong. 
So if you mm-hmm. guess two and one of them's wrong, it's a zero. I can lock in. Just trying to think of older English soccer players I know. Kiki Mc McFoots. <laughs> <laughs> John Soccer. Footy Brighton. <laughs> uh, Wouldn't that be great if the soccer players had like baseball player names? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was like uh, in football when they do the introduction, like when they go like the Ohio State, like the Key and Peel sketch, but they're like really angry. <laughs> Oi! <laughs> Rhodes Scholar. Yeah, right. <laughs> University of Oxford. <laughs> Cambridge. <laughs> The streets of. <laughs> oh, these these players go to soccer academy at ten and then never attend school again. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Naval player Jeff. All right, I'll David Beckham. I was gonna say, Mister Posh. Um, I'm gonna say Jamie Vardy. Yep, Jamie Vardy was the most recent uh, EPL leading scorer. Uh, the first EPL leading scorer in the first season was Teddy Sheringham. That has never gotten that. Oh. After that final round versus Jeff, uh, it looks like Josh only picked up two, even though it was his category. So his total is going to be 160 going into the final round. And Jeff, uh, unfortunately, had to tap or, uh, I guess, in soccer terms, uh, toe, I guess. You toe the ball a little bit. I don't know. Uh, but he got no points. So we're at 125. So those are the scores going to the final round, 125 to 160. My professional opinion, Neil, is that was bad. <laughs> That's why we pay you the big bucks, Ken. Back to you, Eric. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that segue. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we are, uh, the categories for um, the final round here are going to be Jeff, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Josh. Okay, the wagers are in, and again, this will be against myself and Neil. Is that correct grammar? Myself <laughs> and Neil. Neil and I. Me and Neil. Neil. It Whatever be, it's it's against, Ken and Neil. It would be against Neil and me. <laughs> and Ken, uh, that grammar <laughs> was not good. <laughs> All right, let's get those questions. All right, Jeff, this is a question about baseball. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's a geography question. The baseballs used in MLB games are handmade in the city of Torrealba, a city in the central portion of what country? who is alleged to have gotten its name from Christopher Columbus during his final voyage in 1502 when he noticed vast quantities of jewelry worn by its natives. Question number two. Ken, a Chicago-area restaurant named Kuma's Corner came under fire when it announced a burger with chili aioli, goat shoulder, aged white cheddar, red wine reduction, and a communion wafer garnish named for what Swedish metal band? (laughs) Question three. In a 1997 game against the Denver Nuggets, Hakeem Olajuwon scored 48 points. While 48 points in a game is not a very rare occurrence, in this case, it was a record. What record did Hakeem set by scoring 48 that night, a record that has yet to be surpassed? Neil, name the two pairs of actors who have won Oscars for playing the same fictional character in separate movies. And and the, the final question for Josh is a question about Austin. Although it would eventually be renamed for the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin, what was the original name of the Republic of the capital of the Republic of Texas? A name perhaps better associated with its Belgian equivalent. All right, we will go over these questions and be back with our answers. Okay, all the answers are locked in. And right before we throw it back to Eric, just wanted to give a big thank you to Josh and Eric for being Patreon supporters. Uh, without their support, we couldn't keep this going, especially uh, considering today we have brand new sound panels in here that uh, were uh, given to us by the generosity of Josh and Eric's support. So if you'd like to join them, you can go to patreon.com slash trivialitypodcast uh, and get uh, great perks like boxes, posters, stickers, but most of all, extra content, lots and lots of extra content. So thank you both for your support. Uh, and Eric, I want you to read those questions one more time for us. Yeah, I'd also like my next uh, Patreon donation to go towards a bigger K-cup, please, Neil. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, Sorry. question number one was about baseball, really about geography. The baseballs used in MLB games are handmade in the city of Turrialba, a city in the central portion of what country? who is alleged to have got its name from Christopher Columbus during his final voyage in 1502 when he reported seeing the natives wearing vast quantities of jewelry. We struggled uh, a lot with this one. Um, We were kind of thinking something um, 
in the Caribbean area uh, near near North America. So we settled on Puerto Rico, but we weren't sure. Yeah, my uh, my first thought was the Dominican Republic, um, but thinking about the question a little bit, um, when you said the jewelry, uh, I went with Costa Rica. Puerto Rico is not a country, is it? <laughs> the clue there was about the vast quantities of jewelry. You did pick up on that. It was they looked very rich. Costa, Costa Rica, Rica was the correct oh answer. God. Oh, and I wa- I wagered ten on that. And so. we did uh, fifteen on each question. So I did ten on everything except for mine. I said thirty. So all right. Uh, question two and ten. Uh, a Chicago area restaurant named Kuma's Corner came under fire when it announced a burger with chili aioli, goat shoulder, aged white cheddar, red wine reduction, and a communion wafer garnish named for what Swedish metal band? Yeah, this one we were struggling with too. I do remember the news story um, and we were trying to pick a band and we thought of several, but uh, the one we settled on was one that uses religious imagery a lot, and we're not sure if they're Swedish, but a uh, ghost. I went with uh, one of my favorite uh, somewhat fictional bands, I guess. I said Cru- Crucifictorious from uh, Friday Night Lights. Mm. Landry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, known for its religious imagery, the uh, lead singer is Papa, or was Papa Emeritus, that is Ghost. Nice. Yeah, I think the chili aioli had ghost peppers in it, mm. and that was the... Yeah. yeah, it didn't sound like an yeah. Opet burger or a Meshuga burger, Yeah. although I would eat the hell out of an Amana Marth burger. So. <laughs> All right, question three, Matt. In a 1997 game against the Denver Nuggets, Hakeem Olajuwon scored 48 points. While 48 points in a game is not a very rare occurrence, in this case, it was a record. What record did Hakeem set by scoring 48 that night, a record that has yet to be surpassed? Had some trouble with this one, but uh, we just figured 48 is a lot of points for a center to score, uh, because usually it's the point guards of the Fords. So we went most points scored by a center. Well, uh, Will uh, Chamberlain did score 100 (laughs) points once. I said um, most points... Uh, by an African player. Uh, actually, so Ken kind of touched on uh, something in his deliberations earlier, but didn't quite um, uh, get to the to the actual answer. That is, he scored the most points ever without a free throw attempt. Hmm. So it was the opposite of what I was positing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Neil. Name the two pairs of actors who have won Oscars for playing the same fictional character in separate movies. Yes, uh, we we said that this was uh, Robert De Niro, Marlon Brando for Vito Corleone, and uh, Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix for The Joker. Yep, I had the same uh, same reasoning. Yep, points for everybody. Um, Brando and De Niro for Vito Corleone, Ledger and Phoenix for The Joker. Um, both pairs uh, with a Best Actor and then a Best Supporting Actor winner. All right, and the last question in Josh. Although it would eventually be renamed for the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin, what was the original name of the capital of the Republic of Texas, a name perhaps better associated with its Belgian equivalent? And here comes the uh, crushing blow with Josh betting 30 on this question. Um, (laughs) The only Belgian thing we could think of was Brussels. So that's what we said. Well, there is still a lot of things around here uh, named after this. Um, A record store a couple of uh eating establishments and whatnot but uh it's uh waterloo Mm. yep it is the famous abba song waterloo that was the the, definitely a crushing blow that was the uh, bruce lee jumping and stepping on someone's back all right well with that uh the game has ended uh we had 110 points over at team triviality but the better man the better father and the uh, winner of the game of death is Josh with 190. And here's the defeat clip. Fatality. We got naked for nothing. <laughs> Not for nothing. <laughs> I guess that's true. Never for no, nothing. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, ne- it's never for nothing. That's right. Great, jam- great uh, game, Josh. We soiled a K cup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, that was a tough one. That was uh, that was very 
I, I thought I would do better, but uh, that was those were great. I mean, questions. You won. So. Well, you you won, so <laughs> turned us into the Derby City or whatever that town. <laughs> we're the Derby From, City of trivia. The, the Washington Generals of the uh, Premier League. Yeah, you get a shirt that says "I beat triviality at Game of Death in 2020." <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, that. Uh, that was a that was a really good game, Eric. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it was fun to write. Um, I was excited when I got when you said to I could write a Premier League category because I am also a Premier League fan, and one of my best friends is a, is a big Premier League fan. So I sent him a text saying, "Hey, you want to help me write this?" Which so shout out, hi Matt. Thank you uh, for helping me out. I have a string of about forty five texts from him just shouting questions out. So I said, I think I'll, I'll be able to pick out of this. I'm good. Yeah. Stop now, <laughs> please. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much, Eric. That was that was awesome. Great questions. I had a lot of fun. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, shout out to your son, Henry, as well. I don't know if we mentioned him yet on the episode, but uh, shout out to Henry. And Maggie. And Maggie. Yeah. And also, uh, shout out to my wife, Michelle, for helping me play test some of these. And for my three kids who were quiet for the whole time. There so that was go. pretty awesome. Yeah, I'd also like to thank my wife, Kristen, for uh, putting up with the children while I, while I was doing this. So, All right. Thanks again, guys. Uh, that was the game of death for uh, Josh, Eric, Matt, Jeff, Neil, and myself. That was Triviality, Game of Death. It just it, it reminds me of the primal urge as a child to like really have to go to the bathroom. You had to take off all your clothes in order to do it. I don't remember that yeah. urge. That was just you, Neil. <laughs> yeah, not, not a universal experience, Neil. <laughs>